Hey guys, today's episode is brought to you in part by Amazon. Amazon Amazon.com, you guys know you're going there, you know you're shopping there, you know you're doing all sorts of things there. I I don't know what you're buying, dog food, cat food, uh, underwear, t-shirts, PC components, I probably tons of stuff, right? You know you're doing it. Uh, But one thing you may not know you can be doing is supporting Defense of the Patients by going to defenseofthepatients.com and clicking through our Amazon banner down at the bottom of the page that doesn't charge anything extra. It doesn't increase the cost of anything that you're buying, and it helps support the show. We love Amazon. They are the a, a big part of helping us uh, cover the day-to-day costs here. Uh, they're a great company. They, we are uh, very excited to be an affiliate with them. So if you go to defensethepatients.com, click through the Amazon banner, do all your shopping, check out. They'll send us a cut. We'd really appreciate it, and uh, well, thanks to Amazon for helping support the show. Uh, today's episode is also brought to you in part by the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash defense of the patients. We love you guys. You are great. You've helped us a ton. Um, you, 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 more than anybody, more than any sponsor, have helped get the show to where it is today uh, to cover day-to-day costs, to allow us to keep doing this and actually compensate Ursi and Proud and Breaky and uh, these awesome show hosts who have helped bring all this content to you guys for so long uh, for free, of course, because it's all free. You guys, you guys have gone the extra mile and made it not free. You've helped. You've, you've provided donations and uh, you've made that possible. You've made it possible for us to get to this point. So we really appreciate you guys supporting us over at Patreon. There are a ton of really great rewards available there. Roland this week has been tasked with uh, dishing out some of the one-on-ones. So if you guys have donated for the uh, 1v1 mids with Roland, he's going to be reaching out to some folks this week and scheduling those and trying to make those happen on stream. And so hit him up if you've done that and you want to get yours uh, near the top of the queue. That's patreon.com forward slash defense of the patients. Today's guest is lyrical, lyrical Dota. Uh, we've had him on the show before. He did a Tuesday Q and a with uh, Roland and Um He's a, a really, really nice guy. He's a super happy guy. He, he, at one point in the interview, he talks about, um, you know, he just, he wants to be able to bring, even if it's just a small amount of joy, to, a little bit of joy to people's lives. Uh, whenever he's uh, conducting a cast and he's at an event, uh, well, we're all doing the the geeky things that we love to do. And uh, I he he has a, a fascinating background, uh, maybe one of the more moving stories and touching stories uh, that we've had on the show. Uh, he he was super open and honest, and uh, as you'll hear, that's uh, he thinks maybe the the most important requirement for creating content or getting into casting or getting into a role comparable to what he's doing um and uh he definitely lives by that uh so i'm I'm really excited to have had him on the show i really enjoyed doing this interview um his voice is uh going out he was still kind enough to sit down and talk with us because he just got back from china from casting star ladder and he's feeling a bit under the weather and he still went out of his way to come do this interview so we could bring you this great show today uh, so a big thank you to him for that. If you guys want to follow him, he's at Lyrical Dota on Twitter. Uh, you can search Lyrical Dota. You can find his YouTube. You can find his Twitch. Uh, all those things also available, of course, on his uh, Twitter profile. So uh, be sure to give him a shout out. Tell him thanks for stopping by and doing the show. Uh, we, we we love him. We're, we're glad to have him. Uh, if you guys, will, of course, want to find us at P underscore show on Twitter, defenselepatients.com is the website, and you know all the other stuff. So thanks, guys. Here's the show. You are listening to a .p one on one. Perian Flax, welcome to the show, sir. Hello. That is Casey Atchison. Welcome to the show, Casey. H- Hello. Thank you for having me. Welcome, to Suns fan. Hello, friends. It's been a long time. Mott, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me once again. Uh, very excited to be here. Austin Capitalist Walsh, welcome to the show, Cap. Thank you very much, man. It's uh, good to be back. Special guest, Sir Action Slacks. How you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for having me. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Dot P one-on-one. As usual, I'm Cyphus, and today I am joined by one of the great Dota 2 casters out there, Lyrical Dota. Lyrical, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. It's good to be back. Yeah, uh, we had you on the Q and A, uh, but we didn't get to delve into your history and, and learn a bit more about you. So uh, I'm excited to I'm excited to have you on the show and and kind of delve into all that. Uh, you just got back from was it China? Yeah, China. Star Ladder again is good. I, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm getting a little anything? sick now. <laughs> yeah, you were mentioning that. I know you're sipping on some tea. I appreciate you uh, toughing through this one with us. 
<laughs> yeah, no problem. Happy to do it. Uh, so, how was Starlighter? Good times, good games. Yeah, it was good overall. Um, it's always a little bit weird when you go to China because the time zone means that you don't get a lot of like the normal viewership that you would. Uh, but it, I felt like the games were all really good, and I was pretty happy with my performance as well. And then you were an off-site commentator for Kiev right before that as well? That's correct. Yeah, I did the, some of the group stages stuff. It was great. I loved it. Yeah, uh, it, it's nice to. I, I got to see some of your group stage casts, and it was yeah, it, it's good to it's good to see you out there. Uh, it, it, and you're you know you're always entertaining, so <laughs> uh, I I enjoy it. I, I think uh, it's Roland who uh, he feels like you're too happy. He feels mm. like maybe uh, unnaturally happy, uh, drug fueled happy. <laughs> Yeah, um. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, I, I, there's no drugs used really, uh, except okay. for like high amounts of caffeine. I did notice that where it was like one day at Star Ladder where we didn't get uh, as much caffeine, and I talked to them about it. They're like super helpful, everybody that's over there. But um, they ended up bringing some caffeine, and I could notice a marked increase in my my casting abilities. <laughs> so that's the, that's the wonder drug then, just just the caffeine. Exactly. So, uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna do away with Dota for a moment. We're gonna learn a little bit about you. Uh, where did where'd you grow up? So, um, I was born in Oakland, California, and I grew up in Berkeley, uh, which is right next to Oakland. Um, very very liberal hippie ish city. Uh, it was great. It was wonderful. <laughs> is that uh, and where do you live now? Uh, I live up in Oregon now. So I made the move um, after I. I, I so I went to a boarding school for high school um, out in the middle of the woods where I had to chop wood and make fires to eat our shower water and all this stuff. And then uh, after that, I ended up going to college up here in Oregon, and then I decided to stick around. Just love it. So why, why the boarding school? Why, how did that come about? Um... I wasn't like a delinquent kid or anything, but uh, the Berkeley public school system is pretty garbage. Uh, back in like the 90s when it would have been that I was going there, uh, I it was like a million dollars in debt or something like that. And um, we ended up kind of having like a bit of a gang problem, bit of a, you know, people angry and fighting and uh, I wasn't doing the best in school. Um, I got suspended one time because I like threw a log at a kid's head because there was, uh, <laughs> there were, there were problems. It was just like, there, I don't know. It, it just wasn't a good schooling experience and, uh, we wanted to get me out of there. Um, which was a good thing because I ended up doing really well in high school and, uh, it, I think that when you're just like in a sort of violent environment that changes you a little bit too. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, are you, do you know if it's still that way today? I mean, do they still is that is that still an issue with the Berkeley school systems? Um, I'm not sure because one of the problems that people were talking about back then was that it was like there were problems in the Richmond school system, which is right next to it, and the Oakland school system, which are also right next to it, and those are like two of the top five most violent cities in the country, and so they would bring all of the kids into Berkeley also. So it was like Berkeley, which didn't have the best school system, and then also those two, and it all just like came together into problems, um, and so... Uh, I, I think that it's it, they've worked on it and it's gotten better, but um, I, I couldn't really tell you. I, I got the hell away and never really looked back <laughs> since. It's crappy. So, as that is. so you 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 do the high school boarding school and then mm -hmm. you end up going to college in Oregon. Where, where'd you go to college? Uh, this little school called Linfield. Um, it's in McMinnville, Oregon. Uh, so very tiny town, but um, it was really good. I. Uh, I liked it a lot. I, I got to spend um, a bunch of my time just like walking around because there's like it's a pretty nice and pretty campus, and so I would like basically spend time in between classes, sitting in a coffee shop, and maybe playing some like StarCraft Brood War or something else. And um, yeah, it was just it was good. Uh, what would you study? Uh, econ, econ and math. So. I have a major in economics and then a, a minor in math. Okay. So you're maybe a little bit of a stats geek? Yeah, you could say that. I like efficiency, which is why I played Dota. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, I, I mean, that's a lot of moving around. What, where feels like home these days? Or, I mean, 
do does Oakland at all or does uh, Berkeley at all feel like home or is that Oregon now for you? Um, it's sort of a tough question. Uh, I, I like Berkeley and Oakland in a lot of ways, they weren't ever home the city because I didn't go outside that much. Like, you know, when things are all crappy and, and terrible, uh, in a place you don't really want to go and engage in that. So I'd stayed inside and video games was like that retreat away from it. Um, and so I don't know, in a certain way, like the, the Dota 2 home screen is more home than Berkeley was. Uh, or like, you know, the, the, I, I think that probably it's more so Oregon now or basically wherever my wife is, is kind of more where home is. Yeah. Uh, you know, that makes sense. No. Um, I, so, you know, and before the show, I, I was doing what I, what I always do, which is, of course, asking people if there's anything we don't want to talk about. Um, that, you know, and you'd mentioned that you had kind of, a, a, I guess, a rough go with, with your mom and your dad what i did i i mean do you want to elaborate on that a little bit how how did that impact you growing up um yeah so uh, when i was born my mom was with this uh other guy named george um and then uh apparently there was like a she 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 was with this other guy named george and then my brother and sister who were with another guy um they were like it was like their secondary father type of thing uh and then she met my dad and basically said to him you know i think we found a little bit of a problem uh, i've fallen in love with this other guy and then they ended up sort of breaking up and not being together anymore and then uh, i was born and then two years later my dad was gone out of the picture um so it was a little bit nuts in that way and then um the last time i saw him was when i was nine years old uh and then when i was around 17 at the boarding school we found out that my mom had cancer uh, and then she passed away a year later so in a lot of ways it's just like uh like i said earlier video games has always been that retreat for me away from the stuff and it's sort of similar with the problems in my personal life is i uh, try and distract myself from the stuff that goes on with video games yeah i i, I mean you, you know, to somebody who who has whose interaction with you has been primarily, you know, we had you as, as a guest on on the Q and A, and I see you cast. I mean, you seem, and for all intents and purposes, you you must be a, a pretty well put together guy. <laughs> um, you know, and obviously, like you went, you know, from high school to to college pretty quickly thereafter. Um, I, how how did you, you know, how did you manage to keep it all together with with that kind of chaos going on in the background? Um, it, it was tough. I think that uh, having my wife, I, I met her my first year in college, and it was we started dating um, about two months before my mom passed away, and so that sort of pulled us together closer as a couple, and. Um, you know, it was very much a situation where she could have been like, I can't handle this. I've, I've got to, you know, go away. Uh, but that didn't happen. And she stuck with me and, um, and ended up being really strong and, and supportive. Um, but I think also it's sort of, I think we mentioned this last time that I was on the show actually is just like being a, a Dota 2 person, you can't succeed if you're not honest because eventually it's going to catch up with you. It's sort of a similar thing when chaos is going on in your life. You've got to be honest with yourself and you got to be honest with those who care about you and speak what you really feel. Um, because if you don't, it, it all comes out sideways. Yeah, definitely. Um, when, you know, so I guess at what point did, uh, or was gaming always a big part of your life or, you know, cause you mentioned that as kind of an escape while all this is going on, but, earlier in your life were you getting into gaming or or was was a lot of this kind of maybe the uh the catalyst for really getting into gaming um i think i really got into gaming via my brother when i was young when i was probably about like four or five he was playing you know seventh saga on the snes or you know those other great games the original final fantasies and i bonded with him through that um and then that became more accentuated and stuff like through schooling uh like i said the sort of tumultuous schooling system in, in in berkeley uh lends itself to people wanting to try and escape from it and so you you uh 
you, you just sort of get into it in that way. So when I was like seven and, uh, and nine, I think through those areas, I started to really get into Starcraft also. Um, and playing it with a couple of really close friends that I had. So it was always like a, a bonding experience with me and a couple of close friends and my brother. Are you still close with your siblings? Yeah, I'm pretty close. Uh, it's tough because they live in San Francisco. Um, so they've stayed in the area and they're nine and 12 years older than me. <laughs> um, oh, <wow>. So <laughs> yeah, they're, pre- they're pretty older than me. Uh, but I'm still really close to them. And I have now two nieces and two nephews from them and then another niece on uh, my wife's side. So I, I like to try and t- keep in touch with them, but it's it's hard because, you know, I'm flying around the world all the freaking time or yeah. staying up on China hours and not able to talk with them a ton. <laughs> yeah. What do they what do they think about your your career in esports? They were a little bit hesitant at first. Like I said, I'm the youngest. So they're very protective of me. Um, and I actually, I think my sister was the first person that I told about it uh, besides my wife. And I, as she was like, so how's work going at the restaurant? Because you know, I was a chef before. And I was like, well, I, I actually, I have some news. I quit. And uh I've started an online YouTube channel for gaming, and she's like, "Excuse me." <laughs> I uh, I ended up um, showing her it, and then I had to. She was like, "What's your name on YouTube?" And at this point, I hadn't changed my name over, so I was like, "My name is Lyrical Gangster," and she's like, "Oh, Gabe." <laughs> it was amazing, um, but they they have come around and they are liking it now. Uh, they're 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 very proud of me. I think. Well, I mean, then uh, you know, hell, you just got back from China, you know. Right. I mean, totally. you just you just got flown out to China to cast some games. Um, you, have, do they watch any of Do they watch any of your casts, or have they have they seen you in action since you know since your your career has really taken off? A little bit. They've gotten to see me. Um the mainly pictures I, i've shown them a couple of the pictures from like starlight they could do a really good job of keeping up like a Flickr uh, database of all the stuff so i showed them some of those and i think my brother got to tune in for a couple of my casts if i'm not mistaken um but they i mean it's dota you know it's so complicated yeah. they have no idea what's going on uh so w- was starcraft the first you know kind of competitive game that you got into um, yeah, probably that. I, I, Halo wasn't ever like competitive, but I was really into that when it first came out. Um, and I would say StarCraft was, though, yeah. It, it just sort of, I don't know, I loved it. I, it became instantly hooked. Are, are you a competitive person? Um, fairly when I, when, when, I, I think I am probably, I, I don't think I was as much when I was younger, but, um, my wife and I can't really play as many board games together anymore because I don't, <laughs> I, I, I have no chill. I just, I, uh-huh. I go for the, the throat. Um, uh, what, well, what does she to think about everything? I, you know, I know, I know you said she's supportive, but I mean, is she, is she a Dota 2 fan? Does she kind of understand what, what's going on? What were her initial thoughts with everything? Um, I think that she's, she's not a fan, I would say of Dota, but not like in a negative way. It's more just that she, it it doesn't hold a lot of interest for her. Um, but she is incredibly supportive of me. And, um, when I first told her that this was something that I maybe wanted to do, uh, well, it, it was sort of weird because I, I, I needed to buy a new laptop and I wanted a laptop that I could run steam on because I had seen Dota and I wanted to play Dota. Um, and so at first it was really nothing super big for her because it was like, oh, you need a new computer anyways, we'll start it off. And then, um, I slowly got into casting also while I was doing my own job. Um, and then I started to get all this feedback back and then she was like, Oh, people, you know, they like what you're doing. You should, keep on going for it you should keep on trying these things and then uh the biggest test was eventually when you know the day that we got married um it was the same day that it was like my last day of work uh at the restaurant and she had said at that point you know you you feel like you can take this chance on it she had gotten a promotion at her new job uh you can go ahead and you know try your hand at this casting thing and we'll see where it ends up taking you in a year that's awesome what, uh, so I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about you being a chef. Um, right. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, chefs are all the rage. Just probably how you got the ladies in the first place, right? Okay, definitely, for sure. No, not <laughs> at all. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, it, it was, was that, was that like just a job or did you have some, you know, cause some people are, are, are like culinary inspired, right? They, right. they want to pursue that as a career. They, they, they're kind of gung ho about, about being a cook. Was that, was that ever in the cards for you or was it just kind of a, uh, this is what I'm doing in the interim kind of a job? It was very much the interim, the you know, I had graduated with econ and math, like I said, which isn't chef. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, it was something where my wife and I, we wanted to take a trip around the world. And so we saved up our money for about a year uh, and basically like didn't go out, didn't do anything. Um, and then we uh, planned about a three month backpacking trip through Europe where we were on the road every day and like walking, we ended up visiting something like 22 countries, but it was all just a way to make money to make that happen. Because when I graduated, it was right around the time when the recession was at its like, you know, most intense period. Uh, and I was unemployed for like three months, just trying to find anything. And, um, I ended up getting that job. And then afterwards, when we got back from Europe, uh, I needed another job because we had no money. And so they hired me back again. Um, and then from there spring Dota eventually. So, so when does, so Dota two, you, you get into it, uh, or what, I guess what sparked the interest in Dota two? I mean, what made you want that new laptop that, that was capable of running steam? What, I mean, had you played Dota one at all? Were you, what, what was your relationship with the game before all of that? Um, I think that I had watched like one or two videos of, so like, cause Husky Starcraft two had a couple of videos where he was playing Dota two. And I was like, this game looks interesting. Uh, I maybe want to go check that out. It looks fun. Uh, it drew my interest then. And then I think I saw a video of Total Biscuit doing something like that. Um, and it was a game that was kind of like on the periphery of, oh, this is interesting. There's Starcraft two people that seem like they like it. Uh, maybe I'll check it out. And it was again, one of those moments where I was really uh, depressed about my job and like I, I wasn't looking forward to going into work every day. I think I had an interview about this where I talked about it before where it was just like it was kind of a, another one of those negative points in my life where I fully more invested into video games and it just so happened that um, that also sprang into casting. Uh, it was more just like that I, I I wasn't happy with the way things were going in my life, and instead of trying to move to change it, I guess I just sort of like, all right, let's start playing some Dota. It'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, wh- how how did casting begin? Like, what what sparked the the interest there? Um, I was playing Dota, and I had calibrated, um, and then I started to like get the sort of negativity that goes along with Dota a little bit. And I was like spamming storm spirit in my pubs and being angry. And it's like, ah, my teammates. And then I found an in-house league. Uh, and it was one of the coolest experiences ever. It was about, I don't remember how long ago it was at this point, like two years ago. Um, and it was this group called Die Hard Dota that posted on Reddit and said, we're a group of players that want to get together around the 3K range. If you want to come and play, uh, the only rules is that you have to speak English and uh, not be a dick. And so every day... We like that rule. Yeah. Exactly, right? And every single day, uh, I logged on after work and there were like, I don't know, 40 to 60 people there would be like four in-houses going simultaneously and then we started to like gain this community and then people wanted to play but then there weren't enough spots sometimes so then randomly people would just hop on and cast and i remember hearing a couple of the people cast my games and i was like yo this is awesome i want to try this out as well so i went out i bought a mic not really thinking anything of it and I came back and I started casting these games and started casting the people playing them. Um, And if you go back and look to my YouTube channel, the first like 100 videos or something like that is all diehard Dota casts on, you know, whatever date it is. Uh, And then eventually that transitioned over to training grounds which was uh the next iteration of it when diehard dota started to drop away and fall apart um and that was sort of a similar thing and then 
after that one ended up happening, uh, I made a post on Reddit that was like, hey, people have been saying that I should try this out more and more often. Uh, I'm going to try and cast through all of the games of TI. And I think at that point it was TI5, and I cast about half of the group stage games before my voice died and I had to take a break for a couple of weeks. But that got the interest of um, this group called Hefla TV, who does a lot of the, or used to do a lot of the qualifying coverage for events. Um, and they put me in touch with like Hefla Moak and Michael Loris and MRP uh, and, and all these people who, you know, are casters still. Um, and then eventually I got in touch with gods and randomly one day and I was like, hey, do you need any help covering these qualifying matches? Uh, and he told me that they had a complexity game that I could come on and cast on my own channel. And then I casted it. They liked what they saw. They brought me on for a bigger one for the BTS Americas coverage. Um, and so I hopped on and started casting that. And then I, I, I mentioned it, in, I think, in the interview that we did the last time, uh, I left the overlay on for like five minutes. I was like, oh, God, my, my future, it's ruined, it's terrible. Uh, and then literally after the cast, God's message me and it was like, hey, we're planning on doing uh, some coverage for the Frankfurt Major Qualifiers. Can you fly down tomorrow? <laughs> and wow. that was like, uh, yes, yes, I can. And that's that's where we went from there. Um, it blew my mind. It was nuts. Yeah, I oh, I can only imagine. Um, I so I mean, I, that all sound. I I, I was going to ask you like what the highlights of the of, of your casting career have been, but those all kind of sound like highlights. <laughs> yeah, those all you know those all sound like pretty great moments along the way. I I think it was. I I think the Frankfurt Major Qualifiers was one of the highlights for sure. Um, it was a really really cool event. And, you know, it, it was where I met all these people for the first time. And um, it was everybody under one roof. And we just sort of, like, busted out a ton of qualifiers. But that being said, like, since then also, DAC has been amazing. All those things have been amazing. Yeah. So um, I, do you do you find yourself... Uh, able to play less dota these days because of this because of taking on full-time casting responsibilities definitely it makes me sad <laughs> I, I really want to play more <laughs> dota i i'm thinking now i have a little bit of a break before i do anything else again i haven't heard anything back from tournaments so um i have a feeling that i'm probably gonna have maybe a month up to uh where i have time off and i'm gonna try and get up my mmr to where it needs to be which is still way lower than it should be I want to be able to call myself a professional caster, but <laughs> anyways, I, you know, it's funny that you bring that up because that's, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, especially when we like first started doing the podcast, it was one of those things that I, 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 I guess I started to take notice of was people on Reddit saying things like, Oh, who cares that so-and-so is casting their MMR is X. Um, you know, and I'd hear something like, I think at one point I saw a capitalist getting made fun of and his MMR was over 4k at the time for sure. No. And I remember thinking, God, I'd love to be 4K, first of all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I, right. I, I'd exactly. settle for 4K. Like, 4K would make me feel good as a Dota player. I'd be satisfied. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I'd, never, I'd never complain about MMR again, I swear. I swear, Gaben. Um, <laughs> do you... But at the same time, I, I, it, the last thing I ever find myself, when I'm watching a game, the last thing I ever find myself thinking about is... Oh, what's this guy's MMR? Or oh, right. what does this guy really know what he's talking about? And, and especially in the case of, of you know guys like yourself who are doing you know the play by play and the the kind of the hype casting. And I, I I don't know. Does that does it bother you that that's a that that's a critique that that's actually something you have to worry about? Um. Yes and no. I, I think that the bigger thing is if the person knows what they're talking about, and MMR isn't always a reflection of that. That's that's what I think you're talking about as well. Um. Not really. Like, I, I just got a message the other day, for instance, on Twitter, and I was like, you know, all right, I'm, you know, taking a, there's there's this little bit of a break where I'm not going to be doing much content, but I'm going to be working really hard uh, to try and, you know, make it to TI, and that was like my little post, and then this guy messaged me on Twitter, and he was like, I like you, but I like Red Eye more and TI is his and I'm like what what do you what do you think I and Red Eye do like who 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 do you think I'm trying to be the host here or something that that's the type of thing where it's like 
and the only reason that it bothers me sometimes on Reddit is because Reddit does sometimes impact if somebody gets a job or not. And so if there's like yeah. a big title that takes off and it's talking about how like, you know, this person or that person is this, but then they don't really understand what's going on behind the scenes and then it affects somebody else's job. That's where it sucks. Yeah. But absolutely. otherwise shit talking, I don't care really. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when you do get your chance to play over this little bit of a break, uh, what, what role do you prefer to play? Um, I'm a big support player. Uh, I recently started transitioning into playing more carries because I realized that I can CS better than uh, most of the people in my bracket. Um, but I, I think at heart, I'm a support player. I, I like to watch where people are on the minimap and then try and, you know, D ward like crazy and set up ganks and things like that. It's just more active. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, do you have any favorite heroes for that role? Um, CM, I think, has always been like one of my top picks. Uh, I also am a huge fan of Kunkka. I think it might be my favorite hero in the game. Um, I love that guy, and playing him as support is is pretty fun too. Yeah. So, um, do you are you going to be able to stream some of that, or folks going to be able to watch you watch you watch you uh, rise through the ranks of the MMR trenches? <laughs> I hope so. I, I'm actually planning on trying to do another series pretty soon here uh, with Aosin. Um, you can't steal the title yet, but it's going to be amazing. The title's the best part of it. Right. Subpar to pub star. Isn't that good? <laughs> Isn't that great? That's very good. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Uh, <laughs> copyright, copyright, copyright. I exactly. All right. Yeah. If we see that come out, uh, you will be sued. Uh, Mr. Lyrical <laughs> People will be in touch with you. Uh, so don't, don't do that. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, let's see. What else do we want to talk about here before I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I intentionally am trying to not keep you too long because I know your voice. Is, no problem. I, I know you're going out. I got um, tea, man. I'm I, good. <laughs> I, I do want to. I do want to get your thoughts though on kind of the state of Dota, right? Um, do you do you feel like Dota as a scene is in a good place right now? Um, I think so. I, I think also I'm not the best person to talk about it, but from my outside I- experience looking inward, because like there's, I think that there is like this layer of sort of obstification between the people that are real movers and shakers in the scene and the people that even if you're in the public eye like me a little bit, I still don't have the inner workings behind the organizations. I don't know the inner workings behind the sponsorships. I don't know the inner workings behind a lot of those things. Uh, but from what I'm seeing, there are more tournaments now than ever. There are more, uh, what else? Like you don't see as many sponsorships, but you do have a lot of people that are still with like really big numbers of viewership on Twitch and stuff. Um, and so I, I think that by and large Dota is in a really good place right now. Um, as far as like the business is concerned. Uh, and I think that, as far as the game is concerned, it's almost better than it's ever been. Like people, they, they, they talk about TI last year and how there were over a hundred heroes picked pretty much everybody. Um, and how that hasn't really occurred again in the big tournaments. But I think a large part of that was just because of wings dominance at TI six and the fact that they played literally everything um, that sort of tilted the scales a little bit more, but there are more, like heroes that you see picked around nine times or something than you would have had at TI. Right. So you, you do, you feel like the meta is in a good place as well. Yeah, I think so. And teams are banning things out based upon individual teams, play styles, as opposed to banning out the OP heroes. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And we, we definitely saw a lot of that just recently at Kiev. Yeah. I mean, there was there, it, it felt like, I felt like watching that tournament, there were not, as there have been in previous tournaments, like go-to bands that everybody was banning. You know, mm-hmm. there, I, I can remember tournaments where, you know, it felt like uh, like a centaur was being banned every time, no matter what. Or when we first started watching, uh, like in TI4, when I first started really getting into Dota, um, like Lycan was banned every game. There was right. no... You you know teams it was it wasn't because you played the best Lycan in the world that Lycan got banned it was because Lycan was that good of a hero, mm-hmm. um, but yeah yeah Kiev it was well are you playing against EG well if you're playing against EG you're gonna be banning these two heroes are you playing against OG you're gonna ban these two heroes uh, for your first phase so I, yeah I I, I I I like that as well it it, it it's nice to see I, I guess it's nice to see so many heroes in a good place that we can start worrying about. 
uh, maybe somebody's signature hero as opposed to uh, the OP meta hero of the time, you know? For sure. And I, I think that it also, it does put more pressure on analysts because you have to learn all of the different play styles of the different teams, which is really tough. Um, but uh, it's still really good, I, I, I think. I don't know why. Uh, did the... Did the the seven O changes? Did they? What was your initial reaction? Because seven O was arguably, you know, the biggest change to Dota. Definitely the biggest change to Dota since I, I've been paying attention to patches and 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 uh, you know the the direction that the game has gone. Um, did that? Was it kind of a shock and awe moment for you? <laughs> Were you excited? Um, Were you scared? Um. God, I, I'm even tr- like having trouble remembering how I felt about it at this point. But it, <laughs> I, I think that uh, for me, the thing that was weird about it was just like seeing the map change so drastically to open things up more. And it, 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 it was exciting to me. It was really exciting that there was this like new, whole new world of Dota 2 to be explored and to look at. And it felt like it, it revitalized the game in a way that we haven't seen a ton before. Um, I think like you're saying that it hasn't really been a one to compare it to, but probably the biggest would be like 6.82 or maybe like 6. Uh, Eight four the one that started to add in like octarine core and spell reduction, but even that like it pales in comparison. Um, yeah, I, I I was super excited about it, and uh, I still am. I, I think that they've they've moved the game in a really cool direction. Does it, I mean because I, I I always imagined I, I guess I kind of imagine casters in those moments going oh crap mm-hmm. now I have to learn uh or you know a, a new talent tree with eight different talent options times 110 plus heroes <laughs> <laughs> these are the things that i must now memorize um I, I mean was there was there like like a learning curve going into it or or is that kind of i mean i guess maybe that just comes with the job as well like uh, how much time do you have to put into um I, I guess for lack of a better term studying the game in order to to stay abreast of what's going on um I think it varies caster to caster, uh, but I wake up pretty much every morning and I will either start like watching games immediately um, and usually in client where I can watch like the player perspective and then I check out talent trees and I check out check out that other stuff um, and then I'll do that for like, I don't know, two or three hours or something and then I'll play some Dota as well and then I'll watch pro games and try and figure out the meta shifts and so for me at the at the very outset it was a lot of change to try and process at once but everybody was doing that I, I think the bigger thing is that this type of a patch uh, when it comes in for casters as long as it's not right before an event it just means that you're going to need to put in a ton more time um, the, the, the downside is also sometimes for play by play casters when you have your own obs that you can like look at stuff and and start to like mess with it uh then you can like hover over a talent and start a sentence about and as you can see from the talent choices then you read it out and then you form that opinion and talk about it as it goes on um but the problem is at some events as a play-by-play caster you don't get a computer you just have to cast off of the view screen in front of you um and then those kind of tricks kind of go out the window and then you're left not being able to cast as efficiently so uh, there's the little things like that. I, I think that it's more of a, a feel thing, though. Like where, if you're a caster and you uh, you 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 imagine normally that this hero is this tanky, so you say, "Oh, this fight is going to be really bad for them," but then you forgot that they get like a plus eight armor talent. So suddenly, instead of dying, they get out with like limited HP, and everybody else is dead. And then it looks really bad for you because you're like, you said the fight was looking really bad, but you forgot about the talent. And so it, it's more of like when you're casting, you feel that certain fights are going to go well because of your natural history of playing these heroes or watching games with these heroes, but then a talent choice ends up screwing with that. So it makes it harder to accurately call a team fight. And then you curse Ice Frog. Exactly. <laughs> Quietly, under your breath, so that he doesn't hear, because you, you do want to go to TI. After all. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you were mentioning earlier, you know, if you feel like there are more tournaments than ever before. Um, I, you know, that's that's something I, I sometimes see critiqued, and I'll admit I've I've critiqued to an extent myself, you know, in that uh, there, there are often so many tournaments or so many, uh, you know, outlets for pro Dota at times that it's hard to, it's hard to keep up. I mean, it, it's, you know, I... I 
I'll readily admit that beyond like uh, the summit and uh, DAC, and I, I guess I watched. Some, I actually did watch Star Ladder uh, recently, but a, beyond, and maybe this is just me becoming more obsessed with Dota. Who knows? Um, but uh, so, beyond, I mean, beyond those those kind of bigger uh, third party tournaments, I, I almost always watch Valve events. Those are the those are the events that I really get into um, because they feel like there's so many tournament. It feels like there's so many tournaments. But I, I can imagine from a caster's perspective, that's that's a great thing, right? From a business perspective, right? You you want more tournaments for more opportunities to cast. Um, but I, I, at the same time, does it worry you that maybe it, it over inundates the scene as well? I, I don't know. What are your, what are your thoughts there with with the the increase in or the the massive amount of, of tournaments available? Um, I think that it, that it is sometimes a problem, but it's a problem that can be solved by framing issues at big events. So for instance, if you're at looking at TI and there's a pre-show or something that uh, is going on before the games actually start, you can talk about the results that lead that up to all of these tournaments. And then suddenly the fact that there are so many tournaments doesn't end up becoming a hindrance, but rather the developing of a storyline. Um, you can look even at the like the grand finals for this tournament, for instance. Uh, you've got a couple of teams there that um, Liquid they had just won Star Ladder before, defending champions. Uh, you can like build that storyline. You have things like EG facing off against Newbie multiple times within a month because they've been playing over and over again. Uh, even in qualifying events, for instance, there was this period where it was like MDL that happened, uh, the qualifiers for it. There was qualifiers for the summit and there was qualifiers for this other stuff. And in the Chinese Dota 2 scene, uh, LGD got knocked out two times from qualifiers by L LGD Forever Young. So the prevalence of all these tournaments, it makes it hard to keep up with, but it also means that there is more storylines to talk about. There's more uh, depth to the team's play. It, it might mean that the games themselves mean less because there are more opportunities to prove yourself elsewhere, but it also means that there's like, you know, more things to talk about and uh, more Dota to watch. And I, I, I get what you're saying, um, certainly. But I, I think that um, it, it's it's more upon it. It's only bad if people treat each tournament as if they're all like the be all end all. As long as people are honest about it, I think it's okay. Yeah, uh, it totally makes sense. Uh, so uh, before before we start closing out, uh, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you've that you faced along the way in your casting career? Um, biggest challenges. Uh, let's see. I've had a pretty good one. I've gotten very lucky with myself. There's not much that I have to complain about. Um, as far as like things that are just difficult, it's probably keeping up sleep schedule changes while like trying, trying to, trying to keep a lock on how much I work myself. There was like that period of time there's been multiple periods of time where it's like this but I, I remember specifically leading up to like summit five or something maybe summit six where there were four separate qualifiers going on and so i worked uh and started casting at midnight and then i cast until eight in the morning and then i slept for four hours and then i cast for another seven hours and then i slept for three hours and then it was midnight again and i did that for like a week and a half or something um and it's just that that's probably the hardest thing is trying to keep up with all of it and leading up to star ladder for instance there were i don't know so many games that were happening simultaneously and i had to try and keep my sleep schedule constant at least a little bit so i wouldn't be uh having jet lag once i got into china and oh, yeah. also trying to maintain high quality casts because it doesn't matter if it's the first cast of the day and you're all peppery and fresh and you haven't cast in two weeks or something or if it's the last cast of a 12-hour slog and you've been doing it for five days if somebody's first impression of you is bad they're gonna hate you forever with casting so yeah but definitely uh, so, I mean, you, you would, would, have you ever had a, a moment where you felt like quitting while you were doing it? Is there anything that ever like makes you go, ah, screw it. I'm not gonna, <laughs> my, my sleep schedule is going to be normal now. Damn it. I, I'm done. You ever have any of those kind of moments or 
I, I mean, has it been, you know, like, you, I mean, I guess, you know, like you said, has it just been kind of a, a fun ride along the way that, that you feel super fortunate with? Um, I think that probably it's, uh, th- there have been a couple of moments where it was like those, those weeks of nonstop casting and then also not being able to talk with my family or whatever for a really long period of time. Those would probably be the moments where I came close to being like, is this really worth it? Uh, and I, I, I think that it's always been the, the question of like, all right, well, what else would I do? And for me, somebody who's always loved video games i used it as my way to be happy in some capacity when i wasn't able to and the fact that i can do that for somebody else there's nothing else that i'd really rather be doing i i I tend to start the majority of my cast saying like hello and welcome wherever you are in the world i hope you're having a great day and like being able to share some amount of joy with everybody else that's out there as we engage in dorky habits it i i I don't think there's anything else i'd really want to do that's awesome. So uh, <clears throat> this is my final question uh, because uh, is, I, I like to ask everybody who does this this question uh, because I know there are people out there who are listening that would like to you know start uh, start casting maybe not Dota probably Dota uh, they they want to get involved in esports. What would be your single best piece of advice that you could give somebody who who is looking to get into casting? Um, be honest with yourself and be honest about if you think you're the type of person that can do all of this with no guarantee. I, cause you have to have, you have to have talent, you have to have hard work and you have to have luck. And, uh, if you don't have all three of those things, then it's not going to work out for you. I was incredibly, incredibly lucky that it just so happened the day that I messaged gods on Twitter he responded to me the day that I messaged gods on Twitter was a day they had qualifiers. The day that that happened to happen, they didn't have somebody else to already cast those events. And then on top of that, it just so happened that there was an alternate hub that was going on in Europe and they needed anybody for the NA one that they were trying to do. Like if none of those things don't happen along the whole rest of the way, then none of the rest of this follows for me. So you've got to be willing to, put in the work for no guarantee that anything's going to happen. And then honestly, the other thing that's crazy about it is that even if you do happen to get lucky and get to the point where you're at, where I'm at right now, I'm not a guaranteed lock for TI. Nobody is. You never know what's going to happen in this industry. So you got to be prepared to love it regardless of any outcome. Great advice. Well, uh, thank you for coming by and sharing everything that you did. It, I, your story is inspiring, and uh, goddamn, if you're not one of the most pleasant people to talk to. <laughs> thank you, man. I appreciate uh, it. I really appreciate you coming by. Uh, if you guys want to find Lyrical on Twitter, you can follow him at Lyrical Dota. Uh, you can also check out his Twitch channel, twitch.tv forward slash Lyrical Dota. And uh, is your YouTube still Lyrical Gangster? Is that. I think it's Lyrical Dona now. I'm not sure. It's on my Twitter, so yeah, just click on the link there. All righty. Uh, anything coming up that you want to plug that you've got uh, in the works? Um, just some, some more streaming that's going to kind of come out, and, of course, the premiere of Subpar to Pub Star, baby. <laughs> <laughs> TM. Yeah, that's right. TM. Uh, all rights reserved. All rights reserved. Uh, all right. Well, if you guys want to find us, we're at .p underscore show. Uh, you can find our website at defenseofthepatients.com. Uh, go check us out on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash defense of the patients. We love you guys. You are, are you make the day-to-day stuff that we do here even possible. So a, a big shout out to all of our patrons. Uh, I think, uh, you know, oh, and click through the Amazon banner on the website. If you want to help support the show and you don't want to spend any extra money, you're going to Amazon anyway. You know you are. So uh, help us out a little bit there. Amazon gives us a kickback for sending you guys. I think that's going to do it for us. Again, Lyrical, thanks so much for coming on the show. And uh, we we look forward to seeing more of your casts. Thank you so much. And congratulations on going to TI. Even if I don't end up getting invited, I'm going to be there. So look forward to seeing you guys. Yeah, we will definitely meet up while we're there. Yeah, that was uh, was great. I'm still honestly (laughs) trying to wrap my head around it a little bit. So uh, it was really, really awesome. We... We were going to TI anyway. We were definitely going to do it. We were just going to go into uh, considerable debt to do it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, uh, which is something we don't want to do as a fledgling company. 
Um, so that was, uh, yeah, was super great to super great to see. So yeah, we look forward to it. We're gonna see you there, and hopefully uh, we see you there as a as a caster. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully that's what's going on. Thank you very much. All right, until next time, guys. This is Cyphus for Lyrical saying good luck and Godspeed. <laughs>